uh, we'll get going for you ladies. So let me get on my screen because I want to share my screen. All right. Well, I am Michelle Barefoot. I am the director of the Benzie Area Chamber of Commerce. And let me roll back my screen here. Um, and we do these meetings quarterly. And historically, they have been um, in person. Uh, I thought it would give people a chance to hop on and uh, see what it's all about virtually so they weren't committed to moving around because we know our county is small but you know from Lake Ann to Alberta that's kind of a far drive sometimes so um, just trying to think about things uh, you know be respectful of people's time. Um, our quarterly topic uh, this time is health and wellness initiatives and Benzie. Uh, we kind of tie this under our workforce development and business enrichment programming um, called Making Benzie Better. Um, today's event is sponsored by Traverse City Tourism. Um, so uh, welcome. Um, in terms of healthcare, we are lucky to have such a robust, robust network of months and entities in our county, including Paul Oliver Memorial Hospital that provides a variety of healthcare services to our area. In addition, we have other great resources like the Benzie Leona Health Department, Central Wellness, Northwest Michigan Health Services, and Benzie Senior Resources. Um, a couple of them are here today to share about some of their programming. Um, COVID brought many challenges to the healthcare sector, but also brought about the use of telehealth. Um, these initiatives are critical to our rural community and homebound patients, especially our ever-growing senior population. Um, behavioral health is especially at a disadvantage due to low insurance payouts compared to other forms of medical care. I'm sure Karen will be sharing on that in a little bit. Um, that has increased the problem of medical students pursuing other pathways. Um, this has resulted in a high demand for care, but a low inventory of qualified professionals to treat their patients. Um, insurance advocacy groups and community leaders are currently working with legislators and insurance companies to persuade them to reevaluate their payment practices. Um, as a community, wellness attributes to many social factors, um, low crime, higher graduation rates, workforce retention and attraction and more. Um, the the coin term as of late is called health equity. Um, so what is health equity? That is your five key points um, to making a healthy community. So you have obviously healthcare, access and quality. Do we have uh, access to healthcare? And um, uh, one thing that I was in a months in what, uh, it wasn't a webinar, it was an in-person. They were talking about different services that, you know, as Northwestern Michigan, we don't have services like that here in their network. So they're sending, you know, patients down to Lansing or Grand Rapids and things like that. So they're reevaluating their term, their services uh, to discover what, why are we sending all these patients out of network or out of area and what can we do to, you know, that's a lot of driving to the VA hospital in Saginaw. Um, what can they do in, in the health community as a whole to help with that? Um, our neighborhoods right now, and you probably are be, being beaten to death with the this, is access and quality. Uh, we have such a, a huge issue with uh, the need for workforce housing right now in our community. And those are adding the stressors to working families because they just don't, they just wanna go to work and have a family and there's no place to do that. Um, neighborhoods also include access to green space and other like parks and recreational things just so that you're not uh, in the asphalt jungle, uh, which some people like that, I'm not about that. Um, education access and quality. We have two robust uh, school systems here in Benzie County or Benzie Central Schools as 
well as your Frankfurt, Alberta schools. And while they're not class A schools, they do have a high education quality and uh, successful graduation rate. Um, your economic stability really ties to inflation. That's um, our workforce. If, if we don't have workforce here, that puts stressors on uh, employers and things like that, which causes uh, other health and behavioral health and wellness issues um, and, and the cost of living. So we want those resources, those grocery stores, those um, green spaces and work transportation, all of that kind of falls under there. And then you have your social, which is your community engagement, your community centers, um, things that people can do to get out of the house, get out of work. Are they going to go for a bike ride? Are they going to go for a swim? Um, those are all things that uh, fall under those social pieces of health equity. Um, in terms of wellness, we have a lot of wellness things going on. We live in one of America's most beautiful places. Um, we have an abundance of recreational activities that benefit mental wellness, physical wellness. Um, and the new Benzie Wellness and Aquatic Center has plans to boost these initiatives in our community. Um, I wanna thank everyone for attending today. And we were, are gonna start off with Karen Goodman from Centra Wellness. And let me stop sharing. And uh, we'll see what, what, what we have going on at Central Wellness. Thank you, Karen. Well, thank you for inviting us. Um, we are Central Wellness Network. Um, that is our business name. Uh, we are formally set up as Manistee Benzie Community Mental Health. Uh, we provide um, mental health services for persons with intellectual disabilities and uh, severe, and uh, severe and persistent mental illness, and um, for children with uh, social emotional uh, disorders. Um, over the past three years, uh, four years actually, uh, we have expanded our services. Um, I have I've uh, I have like 43 years experience working in the uh, public um, mental health field, and um, the past six years uh, I've returned to Manistee. I originally am from Manistee. I've lived here all my life, uh, but where I was working in um, different locations, um, mental health agencies down south. I ran um, a behavioral health clinic up in Traverse City. Uh, for Pine Rest. Uh, I ran a psychiatric hospital for several years. So I've got a, a, a large um, amount of experience, but I came back to Manistee Benzie six years ago. This was home. This is where I started. So it was nice to come back. But in those six years, we have gone through a pandemic. We have gone through uh, mental health changes. Uh, we have literally been attacked by legislatures to dismantle and reorganize. Um, we are constantly as an agency um, kind of battling with the mentality of rural versus urban. Um, being in northern Michigan, all of us know uh, the limitations on, on the abilities to um, provide different things and have resources in order to provide them. So we have been uh, advocating, uh, our, our CEO, Chip Johnson, advocates every day um, for a rural exemption in which we are not held to the same standards as something like Detroit, uh, because we don't have those resources. So over this time, over these six years, I, I arrived here when we had like 82 employees and we have moved up to 120. We have had about five programs, um, one of them being an opiate health home to help persons with addictions. Um, that is not truly under the umbrella of a community mental health. That is under a uh, substance use disorder program. Um, so listening to our community is just highest priority for uh, mental health uh, services in our area. And the community needed uh, someone to step forward um, and support a medication assisted treatment program. And so working in collaboration with uh, Catholic Human Services, we um, we built this program called the Opiate Health Home Program. Uh, I think the first um, two weeks we had it open, we had a maximum of un, uh, 100 um, slots, and we filled them. And we have not been we have not been 
needing and we've expanded and expanded and expanded so um you know we certainly have the need out there and we're trying to meet that need um through that epidemic time too I, the thing i want to talk about is trauma and i'm just going to really briefly go through this um i wrote an article in 2018 prior to the uh pandemic in which i was talking about kids and 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 you can see in here um you know that i talk about how things are changing, you know, hostilities, the anger, um, the violent behaviors, the bullying, all this stuff that was that was occurring back then, but it's only intensified since uh, since that time frame. Um, the pandemic has tightened all of these issues. Uh, we were isolated uh, during that isolation, pretty much exposed to twenty four hour media sensationalism, political conflict, um, worldwide terror. Uh, so, you know, our levels of anxiety and stress have only multiplied. Um, being isolated and having that isolation for those years um, hasn't improved our mental health. It has only impacted it uh, more. So I think that I wanted to just say uh, at the end of this, I write this article is about what can happen to us when exposed to ongoing toxic stresses. And that's what I'm going to talk about here. Toxic stress is part of trauma. And uh, it provide, I want to provide better information to an epidemic of abuse, neglect, anger, anxieties, and fears being faced by so many. Again, just turn on the TV and you will see this. Um, toxic stress is something that is consistent and ongoing. Uh, you don't even realize sometimes in our jobs, we all have stress. Uh, I do. We do a lot of trauma-informed care here within our agency. At the height of the, uh, when everybody had to go home, um, community mental health still had to provide services. We were still one of those mandated services. And our staff were just as afraid as everybody else. Um, so we did a trauma-informed care for our staff in which we supported them, uh, teaching them ways to handle the stress and the toxic stress and the trauma that they were experiencing. Um, our clients had family members that were dying. They were dying, um, you know, and we're still kind of trying to, to provide all these services in, a, in this just this inflamed type of environment. Um, I, tell, I told our staff that trauma for many of us, and everybody feels it, uh, is like lint. You know, um, for a therapist, we, we hear you know, what the traumatic events were. We relive those with our clients. So as a therapist, that little piece of lint kind of gets on you and you think, okay, that's all right. I can brush that off. And you brush it off, and, and but you do find it comes back later. Any emergency service person feels this, uh, whether you're a police officer, whether you're a, um, a EMT, you know, if you are a first responder in any way, shape or form, you're going to go through these events with people and it's going to change your life. Uh, it might not right away, but it could change your life. There are different types of, of trauma uh, that you can be exposed to. And that can be like a car accident. It could be a health concern, uh, going through cancer, um, having a heart attack, um, your sudden job loss. You know, how many people in this country lost jobs when we all become isolated and then having to relearn new jobs? you know, a death of a spouse. I mean, we all felt these deaths. I had a neighbor that died in the pandemic. Um, you know, these type of things that just make you stop and think. And fires, hurricanes, all the natural disasters. And again, uh, the pandemic is definitely one of the big issues. And for the first and most important, what is trauma? And, and we want to always have a definition. And this is the definition that has come up by the American Psychological Association. Emotional response to a terrible event like an accident, a rape, a disaster. Immediately after the event, shock and denial are typical. Longer term reactions include unpredictable emotions, flashbacks, strained relationships, even physical symptoms like headaches and nausea. While these feelings are normal, some people have difficulty moving on in their lives. Um, there are usually four parts to trauma. We have an acute trauma, which is that single event like a car accident, a horrific car accident, um, an experience of multiple traumatic events that's chronic. Um, I always use the example of a child who's living with a parent who may be abusive to them. And so that's one type of trauma. But now they're removed from that home, put in with strangers in a, you know, in a, in a foster care placement, their whole life changed so that, that there's a chronic element to their trauma. Um, 
complex is both that single exposure. You know, I have a car accident. It's a horrific car accident, but now I have injuries that are more chronic and will go on. You know, when am I going to be able to go back to work? When am I going to heal? Those type of things are complex. And a system-induced trauma. Uh, the same example of the child um, foster care uh, placements, removal of children, that's, that's a system-induced trauma. We, as a mental health agency, realize that we provide, we are a system-induced trauma. Nobody comes to us you know, happy-go-lucky, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be here. No, this is kind of a situation where you just feel like you you just have, have come to your end and you need help, you recognize that, but it's not easy to come to the door and ask somebody for help. We used to say, um, we used to things like say, um, so what's your problem as a provider? So tell me what your problems are, you know, and it's, it, and we've just shift a small shift in that by saying, tell us what happened to you is a total different way of approaching it because one kind of makes that person feel self blame. The other gives them the ability to understand that this is something that they didn't always have full control of. There are things that happen in their lives that they can talk about. So we, we, I have um, further definitions of complex trauma, chronic trauma, but here's toxic, toxic stress, which is really, really important. Um, this is reoccurring negative experience threatening our safety and security. So think about the three and a half years we have all been living in. Um, we have seen it in the media. We have seen it in the legislature. We've seen it nationally. We've seen it statewide. We see it in our communities. These type of um, ongoing threats to our safety and our security, our worries are a constant ongoing toxic stress. Um, sometimes stress can be good, you know, you kind of motivates some people, but, you know, we have some positive stress. Sometimes you have tolerable stress. I can work through this issue. I can handle it. But then when it's constant and it's every day um, and, and cr in a mental health system, we do have everyday toxic stress. Um, we are, weren't only fighting the pandemic. We were trying to manage ourselves. Plus also this was during a time where legislatures were thinking it's time to privatize our whole community mental health system, which really put everybody at a, a point of like, oh my gosh, do I have a job? What's that going to look like? How are we going to survive? I mean, all of these things were constantly in that in that washing machine going round and round, and you never were able to kind of grasp anything at any given time. So one of the big problems with um, uh, stressors like this and trauma is uh, isolation. Your resources are absent or they're wasted, you, you can't get to them. So that will, incre that, that will um, increase the difficulties that you will have. Um, and then the connections, your resources, um, if they're not used wisely, that also can uh, cause difficulties in which you, know, you, you won't be able to um, re manage what's called resilience. Now, resilience is, is very important for many of us. Resilience is how we get through things. It's our way of handling things. And if we didn't have strong foundations in our past or uh, in our upbringing, or if we had those foundations um, crumbled, let's say, you know, you had a, a physical assault, um, you know, that can crumble your resilience. You might have had the the best of upbringings and, and all of the strength and poured into you. However, that situation, how you respond to that trauma can destroy your resilience. You kind of can fall into this deep despair in which you are kind of feeling like, um, you know, ownership for it or guilt about it or secrecy because, you know, people judge. We are so, uh, you know, big with our judgments. Um, even you talked about disparities in regards to the mental health system. That is part and parcel because of stigma. Mental health services, you know, everybody talks about the brain and the body being together, but nobody wants to really support that the brain is part of the body. Um, I worked in a private um, uh, practice for a while. And a lot of times I would work with older adults who had heart attacks. And, and people don't really realize that a secondary of a heart attack can be a level of depression. Um, anesthesia for uh, can cause depression uh, as an outcome after uh, you've gone through a major surgery. It's not a kind of long-standing depression, but it is it confuses people. They get 
you know, it's like, what's going on with me? Why do I feel this way? You know, and it's just working through that process of how this will, you know, how this is physiologically tied to what you're going through. Um, so resilience is the ability to become strong, healthy, and successful again after something has happened to you. And then the ability of something to return to its original shape after it has been pulled, stretched, and pressed or bent. That means being able to kind of bounce back. Um, not everybody can do that, but you know, uh, some people do have that capability. And those people who have a high level of trauma in their lives, it's finding the, their way back to that or building those skills. That's what we will do with people with high trauma. We will build skills on how to manage and cope with what their experience was. And I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the reactions to trauma. Uh, you have physical reactions, um, feeling on edge, kind of anxious, I can tell you our anxiety rates for people have skyrocketed. Uh, of course, abuse, um, you know, substance use disorder, um, alcohol, drugs, that has skyrocketed. These are things in which, you know, coming out of the pandemic, people have, you know, had difficulties with. Being uh, easily, the person can be easily startled. Um, we all know about post-traumatic stress disorder. This is also what happens. Um, some of these symptoms are, are with them as well. Um, a person, you come up behind them and they kind of have this big startle response. That's most likely somebody who has gone through a traumatic experience because their, their startle response is always on edge. Um, they have difficulty falling asleep or staying asleep. They have, you know, and of course we all know that a lack of sleep um, uh, not being able to get into your REM stage can affect your mental health and your physical health. Sweating, having racing heartbeats. Again, um, anxiety has a physiological piece to it. Having a racing heart, you know, sweating profusely, um, you know, feeling like your heart, your, your chest is, is being squeezed. Those are not fake. Those are real symptoms and they're really happening from a anxiety attack. Um, so it's really, you know, when people say, oh, don't worry, just just relax, it's anxiety. That's not possible. Um, I'm going through a physiological problem and um, it's scary. And so you have to uh, treat that person, you know, and with that, looking at the physiological problems. Other symptoms, of course, are headaches, backaches, stomach aches, sudden sweating, like I said, heart palpitations, uh, sleep patterns, constipation, diarrhea, uh, easily startled, more uh, susceptible to colds. People get, you know, have a, a lower um, immune system with higher stress and trauma. Um, you know, uh, alcohol, drug use, depression, anxiety, uh, outbursts of rage, um, emotional swings, uh, you know, I, I talk about the fact that um, we have an epidemic in our world with um, some of our younger people, it seems like um, are pretty rageful. Um, and so as we're coming out of the epidemic, you know, they've been kind of uh, bombarded by, you know, um, bullying and name calling. And, you know, this, this is stuff you see on TV. This is stuff you see in our politics. This is stuff they see in school. Um, all of this stuff is out of control. And so when they're going into the world and trying to participate in the world, you know, the response is not to um, respectfully disagree. Uh, it's it's like my opinion matters and you better listen. And if you don't listen, I'm gonna teach you, you know, you better listen. It, it, our, our mental uh, ability has shifted. Um, and so our capability to kind of be reasoning and to be patient and to be tolerant um, has lessened. Um, and again, I think, uh, again, pandemic didn't help us. We were moving into that but it only exasperated the issues. We have changes in thinking, our reactions to trauma. Um, you know, we have an altered perception of things. Um, sometimes, you know, it's like, don't tread on me. You know, it, it, my, 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 my feelings, I'm just done. Nobody's going to take advantage of me again. You know, so that rage comes up. Um, your emotional reactions, of course, are fear and anxiety. Um, a lot of kids weren't able to get back into school. It was They were filled with fear. A lot of people, we lost 20-some employees um, who didn't come back out of the, uh, not 20-some, 15 uh, employees that decided I'm going to retire or I'm going to find a new profession. 
people really had time to, to sit back and go, what do I want to deal with once I get out of this pandemic? And, and the thought of returning to a very high stress job, well, a lot of people just stopped and they said they weren't interested anymore. Uh, you have a loss of control. You have guilt and shame, anger and irritability. Um, we do know that in our counties, there was an increase uh, for domestic violence, uh, abuse of children. Um, these are the sad facts, again, of, of a pandemic. Our school systems are kind of a fail safe for kids um, because teachers are watching. They can um, see when something happens to a kid or, you know, can kind of measure um, if there's abuse going on. Uh, nobody was watching um, and parents were angry. And, you know, again, they're going through it as well. So tolerance levels are shorter. So when you have, oh, I'm not changing this, I'm sorry. When you have resilience, um, you harness your inner strength and it helps you to rebound. Um, a lack of that resilience will mean that you have more difficulty resolving your conflicts. Uh, you will dwell on your problems. You may be, feel victimized. It's me against you. Um, uh, angry towards, you know, maybe, um, you know, we, we see anger at people not liking things and they're, they're protesting. They're, they're, um, you know, we had people at our state capitol. Capital and 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 our our uh, national capital, um, you know that we're like I'm not gonna I'm not I can't talk about this. This is how we're gonna solve this, um, you know that kind of uh, medium, that ability to kind of talk things out or be rational is is just seems to kind of slipped away. Uh, resilience won't make your problems go away, but resilience can give you the ability to see past them and you can find enjoyment. There is recovery from, from trauma. Um, you just have to recognize it. And if you, if you treat it properly, um, people can make their way through and build this resilience again. Um, again, it's not, it, it isn't just what happened to you that determines your future. It's how you've come to make sense of your life that matters the most. So it's, that's where as therapists, we work with you putting those pieces back together. Um, I wasn't, I'm not sure about the time. Um, how much, are you okay? Are we okay? Okay. Um, we have six principles that we follow uh, regarding trauma informed approach. And these are the things that we've done internally to support our staff during the time of COVID. And now we're going out into the community and bringing this to the community to develop a trauma-informed community. It is in every organization. It's uh, everywhere you see uh, stigma, biases, these type of things can cause uh, trauma, trauma. And again, I don't want it to be kind of like you know, one of those catchphrases like, oh, that traumatized me. No, these are they, a serious trauma can have a serious impact on a person's whole life. I use the example of, uh, I think it was like 1982 or 1983. As I am an older person, when I'm doing trainings with younger new CMH, um, you know, potentials or caseworkers, I will say, how many of you were watching the, um, the uh, space shuttle uh, when it went up? And, you know, and everybody raises their hand. Um, and I said, and how many of you watched it explode in front of your eyes? And it's like, yeah, they raise their hand. And it's like, that was a national traumatic event. Everybody, uh, the reports and the studies after that event showed a high level of anxiety in our young children because the ownership that was given to that, that teacher that was put in space, everybody was, you know, part of that. We sent letters to her, you know, um, we were all on TV watching our teacher, you know, she became our teacher going to space. And then that happened. Children were, were like fearful, um, uncertain of, of, of what would happen. Anxiety levels rose, you know, is my teacher safe? Is my parents safe? What's going to happen? Even though it was, you know, in a spaceship in, you know, going thousands of miles up, they were able to bring it back down to their own personal lives and how that affected them. Uh, higher levels of, of, like I said, anxiety was noted during those times. So recognizing trauma for how it really can impact us, national, our, our, our um, natural disasters, you know, people living through that, they're like, oh, we'll just rebuild. 
yeah, some can, oh, we'll just rebuild. And other people are like, I'm out of here. I can't take this. Um, you know, those have, again, everybody's different. So we, when we look at our trauma approach, we looked at our safety of our staff, our safety of our clients, making sure our facilities manage that, the trustworthiness and transparency, being able to tell them exactly what's going to go on. We are very certain about, hey, you know, you can depend on us. Um, our word is important. So we will work on, you know, um, being trustworthy and transparent with you. Uh, peer support. We have hired many peer support. These are people who have gone through what other people have gone through and they're recovering. They're in their recovery mode. Um, they understand the biases and the, and the stigmas um, that go with uh, mental illness or substance use disorders. And they can talk to an individual at that level. Yeah, collaboration and mutuality. Um, you know, this is something that we do a, a lot and try to do a lot in the uh, with organizations. Um, you mentioned our Human Service Council. Um, we built a prevention program in school systems. Um, you know, that's not a mental health. Uh, required service. It's an extra service that we're, uh, we're adding to our elementary schools because we know there's a need in there. So we're constantly working in collaboration. I'm excited about Benzie County uh, is our test case for uh, we are going to train up a um, law enforcement officer uh, in mental health issues. Uh, so they'll have a dual role so that, you know, uh, usually law enforcement is called to these incidences, but they will have mental health training so that they can respond appropriately to a mental health emergency. Um, empowerment, voice, and choice. These are, you know, giving our clients those, that voice, giving them choices of what, what we have available, um, empowering them to, um, you know, take back some resiliency, um, empowering them and, and not encourage, you know, not allowing them to to feel as if they should be ashamed uh, of their illness. Um, so, you know, we, we kind of provide that education so they understand it. And then of course, the cultural, historical and gender issues. All of this is important. Um, you know, girls are, are more of a, uh, can, can experience, young girls can experience um, depression and, and be more uh, um, reserved or withdraw from people where boys go through depression and they can be more angry and more outbursts. So, you know, the way that our gender affects our illness as well um, is very important. So we, we also address that. And again, um, the effects of toxic stress and trauma uh, agitate our lives and they complicate our challenges and they sabotage our solutions. And trauma and forward recovery, which is oriented approaches, calm and empower the people. So they move that, you know, that trauma uh, experience down. Um, so, you know, uh, if we don't have the, the right surroundings and supports, um, our, our path to recovery will be much longer and much more complicated. Um, so that's the, that's the, that is everything. Um, any questions, any thoughts? Um, I, I will at this time, just any of our attendees, if you wish to speak, just raise your hand and I'll be happy to unmute you so you can talk. Uh, Diane, you had a question. I have a I have a comment. So thank you for that. Um, boy, uh, lots to think about, and uh, um, really appreciate all the good work that uh, your agency has been doing and will continue to do. You know, when it, as you were talking um, about um, uh, trauma and and sort of bouncing back from it and and thinking about it, um, it um, reminded me. I'd say about, oh, I don't know, the spring of 2021 when we'd been through COVID for about a year and, and uh, you know, where a lot of businesses uh, were suffering from setbacks. You know, if you were a restaurant, you had to close down and then maybe they reopen and you could, you know, serve at 25% capacity. If you're a health system, um, lots of um, procedures uh, were not taking place. And so your bottom line took a big hit or whatever. I mean, pick an industry, it really almost yeah. everybody really, really suffered. And there was so much attention on, well, when we're done with this pandemic, you know, and get on the other side, um, we've been through this economic recession. What can we do to, to, you know, come out of that? And I think 
equally important, we should be talking about the social recession. Yeah. So yeah, we've all had to adjust to a new normal of, you know, not going to school and seeing your classmates or not going into your office and, and seeing your coworkers or not being able to go to your book group or whatever it is. And to give us the permission to think about what do we need to do to, to rebuild and climb out of that social recession gets far less attention then and and the economic uh, um, recession is important, no doubt. But you know, it always seems to me a uh, seemed to me to be a missed opportunity to not be thinking about uh, sort of the social recession that we experienced at the same time. And that that's very true. Um, you know, we we have social deficits that have evolved um, through this as well. Again, um, we are social creatures. That is. How we, how we learn, we, we um, follow or, or um, have um, learned experiences by others. I mean, it's a learned experience that if I shoot off my mouth and have a bad opinion and blah, 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 socially, somebody's going to kind of, you know, say, hey, you know, you need to just cool that or whatever. Well, that was all gone. All of that was gone. And so now we're coming out of this and, and you know, opinions and, 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 um, wants and demands are, are high priorities. And again, losing that social thread of, you know, understanding, compassion, um, you know, um, respectfully disagreeing, you know, not being outrageous or angry or getting a gun and, you know, showing you all this is my opinion. So we've got, you know, I look for this to kind of be years of mending um, till we can get this turned around. But as long as our society continues to have um, us and them mentality or um, I'm more important, you're not. I mean, the, our biases, our beliefs. Um, I was I was explaining to somebody earlier this morning, it just feels like, you know, the pendulum swung way over here and we're trying to be inclusive and involved and, and all this stuff. And, and whenever anybody loses control, the first thing they want to do is get control back. And as a society, it kind of feels like it went out of control, but now the answer from everywhere is let's control everything. We're writing rules and laws and, and all this stuff, enforcing things to get control. And I'm not sure how that's gonna pan out. You know, um, you know I'm not a, a, a economist or, you know, a political science major, but I find that, you know, uh, the political shifts that are constantly occurring within our, our government will have significant impacts on us as individuals. So it's very interesting to watch. And I, and I do, I think, uh, you know, they even feel trauma. I can't imagine having my, my office bombarded with people and me having to hide and not being traumatized by that. Um, you know, so I, I think that, it's, I mean, it's on every level and, and it's, I think people are trying their best to kind of get it back under some sort of control, but at the same time, I'm not sure how wise we are about how we're doing that. Um, you know, and it's just going to be, we're going to all have to watch and see and, and control those areas we can, influence those areas we can. And then, um, you know, as a nation, I think we've got a lot of healing to do. Yeah, I just, I have a couple of things. Um, just in terms of when somebody experiences a trauma, um, counseling is amazing. Not everybody goes to that first, which is why we're in this drug and alcohol. And, you know, we got kids in the field cooking meth. We've got issues with fentanyl coming into this country. Um, the opioid crisis is real. Um, and that exacerbates our social norms of all these people going around in a numb state trying to cope with this trauma that they've experienced. Um, you know, I want to give praise to Central Wellness for their collaboration with the Catholic Human Services on those opioid initiatives, um, especially with inmates right here in our jail. Um, I don't know if you ladies know, but they work with them in terms of placing them in facilities that that deal with that specifically. 
Um, Benzie County has a drug court. So the judge works with these folks on getting them healed um, and back out into society as functioning working adults without um, substance problems. And uh, I, I've heard some success, many more success stories than failures. So I, I applaud you on that. Um, we, just as a reminder, if any of my attendees want to ask a question, just raise your hand and I will unmute you. Um, I, you know, I can use the opiate epidemic as another example. Um, our, you know, I was working, running a hospital when um, the whole pain scale came out. I don't know if you remember the little smiley faces every time it was like, hey, where's your pain scale? And, and uh, there was a belief that, you know, we should medicate pain. Nobody should have to feel it. And uh, there were some advertisements um, and some drug companies that uh, falsified their data. Um, and saying that it wasn't addictive and, and, and doctors, you know, kind of like, oh yeah, we can prescribe this and make people comfortable. That's, that's, you know, heal. And, and you're, if you're comfortable, you can heal better, all this stuff. So the opiate epidemic, you know, so we're dishing it out like it's candy. Um, and then, you know, some of the truth came out after that. And then um, after that, so the government said, okay, now we're, we've got a problem. This, you know, nationwide, we have a problem. So we've got to fix this. So now we're going to not allow our doctors to prescribe this. We're cutting people off. Okay. So you dipped them, they're addicted, and then you just cut them off cold turkey. This is trying to get control of something, but not thinking out of the box in regards to the large effect that's happening. You're talking athletes that have, you know, injuries, kids, a 17 year old come to us and go, please help me with my addiction. You know, it, it, these are things, I mean, even cutting off dentists. Now, why were dentists uh, prescribing opiates? You know, that was one of the big areas where it's like, oh yeah, here's a 30 day supply of, of opiates. And it's like, what? You know, so our, our nation kind of had to stop and rethink, you know, but, but this is the secondary cause of what's going on. Um, and then add the pandemic, like you said, you know, now people are just kind of like, I'm numbed out. I don't want to deal with this. Um, you know, I, I, I don't want to listen to the, and I'm scared. I mean, every day, is there somebody who's going to shoot up the world? Uh, we don't know, you know, so it's like it, we we live on edge all the time. So, um, yeah, the opioid epidemic is just one that I um, I just sat and watched that happen. Uh, and, you know, I've, I've lived long enough through the system to go, wow, boy, did we ever screw up there. Oh. But we're able to, you know, help. We do. You're right. We have uh, we have a sobriety court here in Manistee, drug court up in Benzie County, um, part of the sobriety court. I have seen at least and I know Benzie County people come to that court because um, you don't have that service up there. And we send people to the drug court up there. But um, we're a shared community. We're a shared uh, court system. So um, it's it makes it very nice um, for, you know, uh, ease of service to kind of say, oh, this is a Benzie County person. But Let's bring them down to our court because, you know, we are one. Um, another role I have is a county commissioner in Manistee. So that collaboration with the court is really nice for our two systems. And I sit on the the, the uh, sobriety court and you are right. There have been many lives saved um, through these court systems. And I am so proud of our uh, Manistee Benzie courts for what they have done uh, and the lives they have saved. It's just, it's, I sit in these meetings with and watch the judge and I, I am in awe, um, uh, the compassion, the understanding, and, you know, the expectation for change um, are all rolled together in a very compassionate way. And, and it's, it's amazing to watch people put their lives back together. Mm -hmm. Um, earlier you talked and yeah, we we're all dated ourselves, and I know everybody knew what she was talking about. The challenger, yeah. um, you know, just in more recent and, and again, you know, still, still dating myself, um, nine 11 really, yes. um, yeah. was a nationwide trauma, um, mm -hmm. on many levels, whether it was school kids, um, everyone in some way or shape or form was affected by nine 11, um, you know, and that initial reaction, 
you know, you, you watched all the fundraising and things that happen when there's a tragedy like that. And the fellowship that came together um, with our country. Um, and then it spun. And then there wasn't so many things going on. And then the fear kicked in. And yeah. you had the race, the racism, um, the fear, the cultural stereotypes to and and to be quite quite frank, like people in turbans, um, and were people were so wary just going to the grocery store and like, oh no, that person's a terrorist, or and yeah. and, and then that sparked that people's worldview changed to where like this is my and the, and this could be for any tragedy or or trauma um this is my absolute these people are a danger or or whatever i mean i don't think that but um that goes into what where you're saying that trauma now these people have a worldview that you're probably not going to change initially um and then that has just bred all these um, grassroots organization, whether they're white supremacist or or whatever. And it's such a an epidemic in this country that um, you know the whole self righteousness and and you know my worldview or my beliefs are better or right. Um, yeah. And then you get into that hostility it, that spawns your gun violence, your um, bullying, your uh, all of these things. What, where do you see, and obviously Karen's not going out there alone trying to fix the world, um, what mental health is is a huge and desperate need what, and legislators need to act and, and no, it's not about controlling everything, but um, there needs to be more consequences, I guess, for actions. And in fact, there needs to be more consequences for lack of action when you are aware of in a situation um you know looking at these school shootings in oxford the, the kids parents were aware of his mental state his access to weapons and they were just eh, so flipping about it um what, what's what's your take on that well you know that, that, that this is really sad you know it's like uh, again you know um I, I am a hunter. I, you know, I understand guns, all that stuff. I never, ever, ever have, I mean, I've been around people that I just really shouldn't have a gun because they have no concept of safety. But I think, you know, probably up north, we respect our gun use and the majority of us know how to, you know, be safe with the guns. Um, you know, but we have those advocates coming up against, you know, you, these are my rights, why, you know, and, and but yet we have horrific crimes happening with uh, guns that were meant for war, not for hunting, but for war, um, you know, so, so these two idealisms keep conflicting. Um, and it, is there an answer to it? I, I don't think so. Uh, you know, I've sat down with, um, you know, uh, two A advocates and, you know, tried to talk through, kind of mediate and kind of find a, a middle ground, which I think we can, um, you know, and I respect their feelings. Um, and I and I felt that they respected mine, but it's just this feeling where there, there really is no one answer for this. Um, we keep thinking like just writing these laws will make it stop. And that's not true. Um, you know, uh, I, yeah, that's it's so complex. I think kids are angry. Uh, I keep looking at the age groups of uh, who's doing all the shooting. Um, and, you know, they're fairly young, uh, which is 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 concerning to me. Um, what's going on there? It, it is about. I think our uh, Unfortunately, our nation has always had uh, underlying uh, racism, biases, you know, stigmas, mental health, substance use, you know, the color of your skin, the 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 you know the religious beliefs, oh. whatever it is. There's judgment. You know, um, I, I don't know how many people really. You know, I've always felt like coming from Northern Michigan, we've kind of been a little bit more tolerant. Um, but I don't know anymore. You know, it, it feels to me as if even that's shifting. Um, uh, my family, my mom's family was from Detroit and boy, they had some pretty biased, you know, beliefs, you know, lived through the um, the riots and stuff like that. Um, 
I think time kind of softened that, but I don't think time took it away. And you're right. Things like 9-11 um, has ripped that, that, you know, that wound open again. And it's, and because it never healed, we never really healed it. It's going to be the same with gun control. We'll never really find one answer. Um, it's going to take everything that we have uh, to fix these very complex problems. But, um, you know, just doing one thing, uh, you know, it, it's going to take multiple things. So I think that's why, you know, it, it gets so frustrating. And I think that's why kids, you know, uh, yeah, their biases, their anger, their feeling as if they're mistreated, you know, there's a multitude of reasons, um, you know, gang violence is in there, all of this stuff. A gang is a family to somebody who has none, you know, the kids who are, are uh, um, you know, displaced or don't feel belong, have been abused, they are easy pickings for gangs um, because a gang will give them a sense of belonging. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so, so again, here's another big complex problem, probably more in our urban areas. I know we had some of this up in the rural area, um, uh, down South where I worked for a little while. Um, you know, these, these young gangs were, were growing, but it, it is a thing of displaced kids trying to find somewhere where they belong and they're not judged or, or, um, criticized. So, um, yeah, I, it, there's a laundry list of issues, and you're right. Mental health kind of goes through all of them, um, you know. Uh, but we'll just keep trying to educate and affirm to people that, um, you know, uh, there is healing. You just have to be willing to go through that process. All right. What one last thing, and then I'll, I'm going to turn it over to Linda. Um, just kids going back to just kids in general um thinking back when uh all of us uh were in school things discipline specifically was so much different than it is now and i'm not saying bring back the scary wooden paddle but mm -hmm. kids in the last even 40 years keep getting a little bit longer of a leash longer of a leash and then their outcry and and i and i get it i don't want a kid to ever feel that they can't come forward to a trusted adult on abuse or, or things like that or bullying. Um, but you have taken, not you, but like society has taken so much authority and I will loosely say authority from like parents and teachers and counselors mm -hmm. that these kids can stand up in a classroom and hit a teacher, spit on a teacher and, the teacher cannot do anything about it. Yeah. And, you know, this is led into workforce issues in teaching because, I mean, I, I would rather go work in a prison than go work as a teacher right now because the hostility is so, so there. And I, I feel like the schools, not that they don't do enough, but, um, and certainly our schools, Benzie's with Amy Airport is working on some uh, mental health initiatives but there's a whole realm of things that need to be addressed so that these kids, like the, their first thing is to flip into 180 anger over something silly, like, okay, um, somebody bumped them in the hallway or something. And, yeah. um, you know, how can we come alongside these kids? And yeah, and I realize there's a lot of environmental factors. Um, you know, maybe it's a broken home or no support at home. You know, there's a million things why kids act the way they do, or they're just jerks. Um, what, what's your take on that, Karen? Well, we, we're right in the middle of that. Actually, uh, Manistee County has had a significant um, uh, increase in juvenile delinquency uh, and some pretty significant incidences. So um, next month, we will be starting a task force to look at this issue, um, not just juvenile delinquency, but our kids in general, it's everything you've said, you know, it's like, you know, standing up in the classroom and, and swearing and yelling at your teacher, throwing your stuff around in the classroom is not acceptable. I always, you know, at one time I was concerned because it seemed like the school was the parent. Um, they were taking on the discipline, they were taking on the responsibilities. And then of course, you know, then, um, you know, that got, again, that pendulum went too far 
you know, and it's like, and then parents are like, well, you can't raise my kid, you know, they're my kid. And, and, and so you, so the, the school is like, well, don't touch those kids. Don't talk to those kids. Don't do this. Don't do that. And now we're back to another extreme. It's like, you know, I just got to lock my classroom door. I, I can't interact with the kids. You're afraid to be with them at any given time. So again, they're, they're being isolated or they're being, you know, kind of shunned. Um, and nobody's providing that social interaction. Nobody's taking them under their wings. Now, again, in Northern Michigan, we might have more intimacy with, you know, being able to kind of help kids out. Um, but in, in big uh, suburban schools, you know, I, I, you know, everybody's afraid of everybody. It, it, it's, it's, it is a difficult role. But um, again, in our area, because we've had some major difficulties, some pretty intense stuff, we will be working at a task force and, and you know, figure out what we do well and what we need to do more of. Um, and everybody that, you know, their lives touch a kid in any way, shape or form will be at that, at that table uh, talking about it. I love it. I, I love this conversation and this was really great and informative. And uh, if you have any questions, please reach out to Center Wellness um, on their programming. And our next presenter is Linda Stark from Northwest Michigan Health Services. And uh, take it away, Linda. And on, you are on mute. I'm off of mute. Thanks. I'm Linda. I am Linda Stark. I'm the community health worker or the CHW as they call us here at Northwest Michigan Health Services. I'm going to give you a little bit of background about what we do, our little history, what's going on, and how we're affecting some of the people in the communities. And I got to first figure out how to share my screen. And that's not the one I want. This is the one I want. There we are. Um, let's see. Okay, can you guys see that? Okay, good. Um, I'm trying to get me moved out of the way. Well, here we're talking about um, basically what we do. Northwest Michigan Health Service is a medical, dental, and behavioral health services. And our motto is to heal, smile, and help people breathe better. Um, a little bit about us. Um, Northwest Michigan Health Services, or as we're called MNHSI, has been established since 1968. So we've been around for like 50 years. And we are currently still a nonprofit, a 501c3 entity, and we are one of 40 federally qualified health centers in Michigan, which means being a federally qualified health center, we're open to anybody. Doesn't matter who you are, you're welcome to walk through our doors. In the year 2010, NMHSI committed to the expanding of their services to all of those in the underserved population in all the areas we serve. Let me explain how we got there. We started in our history was in migrant workers. We were going out to the farms, working with them and giving them, helping them with their health services, basically, making sure that they were being taken care of, mom and daughter or mom and babies were taken care of, but it was only on a seasonal type basis because we were working strictly with the migrant population. Today, after they made that decision, we've opened that up and it's open to anyone in the community. And we provide those three basic services. All those services are elaborate in themselves. I mean, I'm talking to Karen and here she is talking behavioral health. Yes, we also offer the same things for our patients as well or for any of our patients, but we also do collaborate with Central Wellness because we happen to be in the same building in Benzonia, which is kind of nice. So that's kind of a little bit of our history background. Um, again, our mission at Northwest Michigan Health Services is dedicated to providing quality health care through a wide range of health services to the people in our communities, always serving with dignity and compassion. Our communities consist of not only in Benzie County, we also have a facility or clinic in Traverse City, which services Leland all Grand Traverse. Although we still get Traverse City people here as well as Leelanau in Benzie, we also serve Manistee and we have a clinic in, in Shelby Township, which is in Oceana County. So we have that broad Western side of the state kind of covered to help those people who may not be able to get services. Some of our values that we, that we have here is excellence, the provision of superior healthcare services, and when we say healthcare, we're talking a well-rounded healthcare, which includes med 
you know, medical, dental, and that behavioral health piece. Integrity, the utmost honesty and truthfulness in our words and deeds. We're not going to steer anybody wrong any way you look at it. And if we don't have an answer, we're going to steer you to the right place. Compassion, we behaving with kindness, empathy, and concern in every situation. We make that point to try and listen to our patients and do what we can to help them, which is what me as a social, as a CHW does, and I'll explain a little more of that as we get to it. Um, and the last thing, we respect our patients. We treat them with our patients as we would treat each other with a high sense of self-esteem. And we teach our employees the same thing, or we, we respect our employees the same way because it's important to know that they're all respected for what they do. Uh, we have a model of care. It's a comprehensive care. It's a team approach to meet the large majority of each patient's physical and mental health care needs, including prevention and wellness, acute care, and chronic care. We are a patient-centered care center, health center that is a relationship-based and respectful of each patient's needs, culture, and values and preferences. We have coordinated care. Care is a coordinated across all elements of the broader healthcare system with help from the community services and supports. Hence, there's what we have, what is it, community connections here in Benzie County, which is amazing. We are part of that system. We also work together, and I, as a CHW, work as part of the care teams here so that we're working as a group of providers, not just as a single person alone. We have accessible services. We have additional services and supports are in place to provide easier access for our patients. We have extended hours. We've just now started to extend our hours in the Benzie Dental Clinic. We used to only be open till seven on Tuesdays. Now we're extending that to Tuesday, Wednesdays. Um, we have telehealth. Still, we do use some audio as well. So if you can't see them, since we're so limited by our broadband here in Benzie, some of our elderly patients don't have that ability to, to communicate video with their providers. So we can still do that audio. We provide 24-7 call service. So if you, eight o'clock at night, you got an issue, you can call the service and they're going to get you somebody. We have our online patient portal. We have our migrant mobile clinics, which is in the north and the south. And we have interpreters that help, which also our new interpreter that we've been using is we have a Ukrainian population in Traverse City that has come in from the refugees and we work with them. We work with the interpreters as well. Our migrant mobile units, our health, their little health clinics all in one thing on a bus. Um, they're going to be starting in May. They're going out to the different farms in Oceana County, as well as in Grand Traverse County, Leelanau County, to the different farms and taking services to those workers who otherwise are working from dawn to dusk and don't have the ability to get into those clinics. So we're taking those mobile units out. And last but not least, we have quality and safety. The organization is committed to quality and quality improved practices which kind of falls along that pandemic say, you know, we were here during the pandemic, just as Karen was and, and central wellness, but we always carried those enhanced um, protections for both our patients and our, you know, and our staff, keeping that safety value, as well as giving, still giving the quality of services that they deserve. Let's see. One of the things we talked about was I've talked about is that no one is turned away. We use a, a it's called a sliding fee scale, and it's based on um, on the number of people in the household, the income in the household. That service is there for anybody, and a lot of our patients are Medicaid patients, Medicare patients. Some have no insurance at all, which is why we would use the sliding fee scale. Some of our patients are um, underserved. They may have insurance, but their their you know their copays are so exorbitant that we'll work with the sliding fee to help them take care of those as well. Um, for and it goes on and it, we use our basis is based on the income tax return or W two or three recent pay subs to to assign which is you know a best plan for them on that slide on that sliding fee scale. And all of you right now probably have heard, and I know you've heard about the Medicaid redetermination. That's a really big, important thing that's part of this piece that goes together for all of us. 
And as we all say, we've got our welcome to wellness. This is our Northwest Michigan Health Services. This friendly team is committed to making sure consistent, quality medical, dental, and behavioral health services are enriched for everyone in the community. Same thing. We don't turn anyone away at our front door. And I have to be honest with you, I have had to deal with, as a CHW, maybe this is a good point before I get into the wellness part, to talk about what I do as a community health worker. I work with the providers to help our patients get through those barriers to some of the services that they're looking for, or maybe they don't have. Okay, you, you've got an appointment, you need to get someplace, but you don't have anything, any way to get there. How can we do that? How can I help them? I work at looking at transportation services. I look at them for referrals for other, other doctors that they may need extensive care with. That is beyond our scope, so we're referring them out. I help them get there. Um, I have I work with those our staff members to make sure they're coordinated. The care is exactly what that patient needs, not just their idea, but what as a group we say, okay. And with that patient's concern and with their input, we help them. We don't do that for them. We help them learn how to empower themselves to get these things done. Those are some of the things I do. I coordinate that stuff. I work with them. I look for resources so that our patients are at least hopefully coming out on the better end of things for them. Um, here's an example of some of it. We have our medical, dental, behavioral health, and patient support services. I fall under that patient support, support services. We're, and it says we're a certified patient-centered medical home. We take a team approach to serving the whole person through medical, dental, and behavioral health services. Um, and we do. I mean, I, I feel very happy that our dentist can say if somebody's having some problems in the dental chair, and there's some anxiety going on, we can get our, you know, our mental health therapist to come in and say, hey, let's try some strategies to take some of that anxiety down. Or if somebody's it, you know, we have somebody in the health side that's seeing our medical provider that has some issues. They can collaborate and talk to the dentist and say, well, what can we do? Is there something we can do right now or do we need to bring them back? So we're always working as a team together when that's what this talks about. The medical side, it says we're, we services we provide are primary care services, physical exams, immunizations, chronic condition management. We have an RR care manager. Um, our end care manager, excuse me. We have preventative screenings as well as we have women's health services, which is for gynecology, prenatal care, those types of issues. Let's see here. On the dental side, we do cleanings to dentures. We provide top notch dental services to keep your smile confident and bright. And our services are cleanings, x rays, fillings, crowns, and bridges, dentures, root canals, limited root canals right now. But I think this is a good time to let you all know that Benzie County, our um, clinic here, has just, we have hired a new dentist, Dr. Nakvi. He's been with us a short time, but he's amazing. Um, he got his degree from the University of Detroit School of Mercy Dentistry, and he worked downstate in the urban area, and he did some work in the rural area. And he actually sought out this area up here because he chooses to work with these types of individuals that are here. Everybody in the rural area has a need and he just loves being here. We are very happy to be able to have him on our staff now. He's the one who's chosen to work those Tuesdays and Wednesday nights because he says there's a need and that's wonderful on our part. Um, behavioral health, goodness, um, it says we I understand the importance. Karen, I'm right there with you. We talk about services include depression and anxiety, stress management, relationships and life adjustments, substance abuse treatment. We work with them. And if we have to, you know, refer them out to maybe an inpatient clinic, we can do those. Helping with chronic illness could be anything. Developing a health improvement plan. We work with that behavioral health is going to help them to try and lift their quality of life and bring them out of some of those states that they might be in, those stresses that they have, how to relieve some of those. Um, patient support. This is us, me. I said, we help our patients overcome barriers to healthcare, cost, time, transportation, language. 
We have health insurance enrollments. If somebody needs enrollment, I'm a navigator. I can help them in the marketplace. I can help them in Medicaid, whatever. We have the sliding fee program. We have pharmacy services and the discounted drug program, which is the 340B program. We have extended access after hours, online patient portal, our mobile clinics, which are available. Translation interpersonal interpreters and bilingual staff. In Traverse City, they speak both English and Spanish. We have an interpreter and we now have our Ukrainian, Ukrainian interpreter. She's wonderful. And we have some wonderful families come in, but they're refugees from the Ukraine and they don't speak English. Um, Shelby Township, that's a huge migrant population down there and they all speak Spanish. So all of them are bilingual mostly. Coordinated care with specialists and we connect to our community resources. Always try to do that. You guys are my greatest resource, I'll be honest with you. Um, locations, throughout our history, we have four health centers, Traverse City, Benzonia, Manistee and Shelby. And included with that, I want to make sure, and I'm not going to disclude them, we also have some um, school services. We have a uh, service or a clinic inside MAPS, Manistee High School. And we also have a clinic that's inside Man um, Mason County Central. So they have access to mental health issues there, a behavioral health therapist, as well as in Manistee, they also have the clinic for medical as well. And I know I'm a little shorter, I'm a little less wound. You know, I ours is more specific to what we do. And then you asked about, we wanted to talk about some of the local community support that we're doing right now. Currently, we're working with our schools doing reduced, um, reduced cost sports physicals. MAPS has got numbers of days doing it. And I'm working currently with the Frankfurt Alberta School so that we'll be able to offer it at the school for a reduced cost for those sports physicals the deadline was April 15th. And instead of trying to reach out to a, a PCP or a private um, provider, it might be easier to do this because you never know. Our migrant outreach services is beginning on May 1st, and that will be going out to the different farms. We have some larger farms down in Oceana County, and they just automatically, those farmers and those companies, I guess, that utilize all of those migrant workers. Um, I look forward to the times when we can come out and it's not just once, it's like almost every week or every two weeks, depending on the population. Just to let you all know, we're gonna be at Summerfest in Tom Thompsonville, as well as we're gonna be doing um, the Cherry Festival this year, which is gonna be kind of fun. And um, I see what else have we talked about here. Anyway, I, those are the things that we're working on. Um, there are some other things in the work in Traverse City, but I don't know too much about those yet. It's still kind of there. And I can tell you that we do have um, new staffing on board. I talked about Dr. Nakti, and many of you have already know about Heidi, Heidi Britton, who is our CEO, but we have now hired on Elaine Baker. He's our new chief operating officer. He is, um, he grew up in Texas, so he has a little Texas twang, but he's wonderful. He previously worked in um, Texas and the, I guess you would say in the commercial side of the industry, of the health industry. However, he discovered that um, the, the FQHCs are the way to go because they serve everybody. And he wound up in Alaska and he has a, he worked in Alaska and then he decided it was important to be back with family. So we were very fortunate enough to be able to hire him and he is part of our system and he's a wonderful individual. Hopefully you'll get the opportunity to meet with him soon. And um, I guess my last slide here, maybe, there we are. My last slide is, this is me. If there's any questions that I can answer, I'm sure you may have some, you may not. I've tried to answer as much as I can. I know that we, some of the other programs that I didn't mention is we do the remote monitoring, blood pressure monitoring system. That's a grant that we've got so that we provide our, our health, our patients that have high blood pressure or hypertension, they can come in and we provide them with a, their own blood pressure cup, their own scales and their own, um, what is it? 
pulse ox so they can do their oxygen levels. And then we start them on the program. It's, it's coordinated with an app on their phones. They take their pressures every day and it's sent automatically into the office. So the doctor can monitor on a daily basis what they're doing. We do this all for a no cost to any of our patients. I know they're in, they're starting and looking to expand in other areas and family areas and women's areas as well. So we're hoping to be able to expand and get those out there, those programs started really soon. So does anybody have any questions? Maybe, maybe not, that's okay. Not really a question, but um, the dental van that rides around at the Betsy Valley Community Center, that's yours, yes. So you're doing some good works there. We try. <laughs> We try, dental's a little tougher right now, but yeah. But you'll be seeing our vans. Hopefully we'll be able to take our van and be able to use it at Frankfurt, you know, the high school for the sports physicals. That's our goal. Mm -hmm. One of the goals to get there. The dates are being finalized, but it is going to happen. So we're very happy. Good. Yeah trying to make sure that the community that we are serving is also being able to be reached out to in ways that's a little easier for them to reach. I know how hard it can be to get into your primary care just for a sports physical. And you're, I know how you guys are, but I know when I'm going to the doctor, it's going to take me weeks to get an appointment if it's something like a wellness check. Mm -hmm. So being able to provide that service and at a reduced fee so that those students don't have to or those families are not worried about whether they're going to be able to get that or if their insurance, a lot of insurance companies don't pay for the sports physical unless it's combined with something else. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it's a nice opportunity to help our, our community out. That's awesome. I, I would just like to add, um, as a mental health agency, um, we, we have worked closely with um, NMHSI, I, I've been on their board for over eight years. Um, you know, we are always looking for board members from each of our communities that are represented um, because they bring great value um, to our planning and our process. They've had great leadership, the addition of the health workers and um, their expansion into the school systems has, has been wonderful. Um, dental services in Benzie County, uh, you know, that's an amazing service. And uh, we as a mental health are so grateful that, you know, we're there with both public health and NMHSI. Um, the thing that, that NMHSI can provide is as a qualified mental health, uh, qual qual not QMHP, but an I FQHC. <laughs> An FQHC. Um, mental health, uh, our role is to provide mental health services to the severe and persistent mentally ill. There is a whole big field of individuals who have mental health needs that are not severe and persistent. Um, it's just, you know, general mental health needs. And um, NMHSI, you know, helps with that gap. Um, you know, uh, again, we have to, to show that the individual's uh, mental illness is impairing multiple parts of their life. And, you know, it's been consistent and chronic for a long time, where just general um, outpatient therapy for maybe, you know, some anxiety or depression that is not severe and, and, and impairing their lives. NMHSI provides that gap and it has been wonderful. Um, you know, especially up in Benzie, where we can transfer between our programs um, when someone's, you know, uh, only in need of, of maybe just some mental health services, some behavioral health counseling. And then from them, you know, people that they see that may have more chronic of an issue and they need a case manager. I mean, it's it has been wonderful. It's a great um, collaborative effort. We work together. Yeah. 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 It's great. So, yeah, I'm. Uh, yeah, the NMHSI is just an amazing organization. Thanks, Karen. Nice to hear that from you. <laughs> so, any other questions before we pass it back? Last call for Linda, and thank you so much for that. You are so welcome. I'm so glad I could do this and be here. Thank you. And our last presenter, is, but certainly not the least, uh, Diane Tracy. 
from the Benzie Wellness and Aquatic Center to tell you about their new game plan and uh, the resources that they want to provide to our community. Oh my goodness. Linda, you got to I can't get rid of this. Karen, what was your secret earlier when you got rid of your Yeah, what was it when um, you got out of there, Karen? At the, at the top, uh, yeah. it says um, there's a green. Uh, it should be up there that you can um, stop sharing. It says resume share, pause share. Stop uh, share. Now there we're there. Oh. Yay. Thank you. All right. Well, let's see if I'm successful with sharing my screen and get my slides up. There we go. So let's get rid of that. And let's start the slideshow from the beginning. So thank you so much for the opportunity to um, be able to uh, spend time with you all. I'm going to be talking about a an organization that's more of a promise um, than an established facility. We don't have a place yet. We don't have staff yet. It's completely volunteers. We do have a couple of programs we offer and I'll touch on that, but it's um, something we've been working on for um, several years and uh, hopefully uh, this will become a place where we can all go um, in the not too distant future. So, I'll start off with our mission and our vision. So it's a pretty broad aspiration that we have. And I'd say probably the most important word in this aspiration statement is all. And I was so pleased to hear Karen talk about that sliding scale um, for folks, because that is um, a concept that we um, plan to embrace as well. And our purpose um, will be to give um, all kinds of folks an opportunity to um, enjoy um, programs and spaces and um, time together. And we do are gonna think about experiences that strengthen the mind, the body and the soul. So people have been thinking about indoor recreational facilities in Benzie County for decades and specifically indoor pool. And um, in the past, it's been sort of thought about as a standalone or maybe attached to the school. And what's different about our approach is we've expanded the concept to an integrated wellness facility with a variety of kinds of programs and spaces. The more points of entry that we can provide people with, I think the better chance we're gonna have that they're gonna find something that's gonna to appeal to them um, throughout their lives, throughout their wellness journeys, and frankly, help our bottom line. So as a standalone indoor pool, this isn't a viable concept, but as an integrated wellness facility with lots of different partners, um, we really think this uh, has great potential. So one of the most important things in terms of wellness is just thinking about public safety. So I wanna share a story with you. This is Caleb Sutter's story. Almost 20 years ago, he went to the, the beach in Frankfurt, climbed up on this pier with his friends and they were swept off. Caleb's friends got back to shore, but Caleb didn't. Drowning is the number one cause of death for children under the age of five and second leading cause of injury-related injury death among children under the age of 15. Caleb grew up sound, surrounded by water, but there are no indoor community pools in Benzie County. We don't have them at the schools. The closest Y is up to 45 minutes away. So the only way that our children receive um, swimming and water safety instruction um, on a uh, community-wide basis is by watching videos in their PE class. Even experienced and trained swimmers struggle with rip currents that arise in your structures like piers and break up wave actions in large bodies of water. Now, a generation later, we hope Caleb's classmates' children will participate and learn to swim water safety lessons at an indoor community pool when our project is completed. And this is a photo of one of the programs we are offering. So for the last two summers, and this will be the third summer, we um, provide learn to swim and water safety um, classes at um, Bellows Beach in Crystal Lake uh, for up to 50 
elementary school children in Benzie County. And this is a picture from one of our classes. Formal swimming lessons will reduce their risk of drowning by 88% and enable them to enjoy lifelong sport that opens the door to so many recreational activities in Benzie County. So the conceptual design elements we're thinking about are how can we integrate health, fitness, wellness, programs for all ages and on-site child watch, gathering spaces for people, recreation and accessibility for all. So people of all abilities, people of all ages, people of all residential statuses, you know, not just people who live here year round, but seasonal visitors, tourists, um, you know, people who are just passing through and those of fin limited financial means. So um, the Traverse City YMCA has a membership program that has a sliding scale, not unlike what Linda was talking about, and we hope to be able to adopt um, that kind of a program for our, our facility. So this is a conceptual rendering. It is not the final design plan by any stretch of the imagination, but just think about the possibility. So um, you will, uh, this down here is the front door. You walk into the front door. Over here is child watch and outside would be a playground for the child watch. We have two different meeting spaces. This is a little meeting room here. This is another one that's a wet or dry meeting room. Great place to host the um, eight-year-old splash party for their birthday. You sugar them up and in here and then you send them into the pool to have a little bit of fun. Uh, registration desk is this horseshoe affair with a little coffee and juice bar. We'll have fitness here, cardio, uh, strength training, and weights. We'll definitely have some uh, movement studios. Uh, we're envisioning having one with a collapsible wall so you can have a smaller studio and a larger studio, Pilates, yoga, Zumba, bar class, that kind of thing. And we're, we'll plan to have flexible flooring. So if this space needs to be used for a gathering or a meeting, it could do so. And conversely, if these meeting rooms need to be used for, say, overflow yoga or Pilates, that'll work as well. We've got locker rooms. We've got a full-size gymnasium that is shown um, striped both for basketball and indoor court sports. So I will tell you the number one request we have had from folks as we share renderings is, can we play pickleball indoors? So we certainly want to accommodate that. Over here, we don't have it drawn in on this rendering, but we're imagining um, an outdoor fitness court, an outdoor classroom. This whole space back here is reserved for future therapy and rehab. And we'd love to be able to offer kind of a continuum of care if someone say has a, a new knee or new hip, you know, they might start off here in therapy and rehab. And once they graduate, they can um, come in and use some of these other spaces. Um, it, all under one roof. And I'm a swimmer. So my favorite part is over here where we have two different pools outside the locker facilities. So this would be our shallow and warmer water therapy pool that also would be used for teaching the little itty bitty children. People could come in here and water walk, do water aerobics classes, um, that, that sort of thing. We have a viewing area here so people, if, if parents can watch their children having classes. And then the, the uh, 25 yard long uh, lap pool. The feature that we hope to provide um, for free for anyone, um, again, regardless if you live here or not, because um, we really are serious about being dedicated to um, providing access to all is this hallway that goes all the way around the building will double as an indoor walking track. So six laps is a mile if the building is sized like this. And um, the beauty of that is people may come in and, you know, start off by just walking and maybe observe, you know, what class is going on and think, oh, that looks like fun. Or, oh, there's my friend over there having a cup of coffee. Maybe I'll stop and ask that person, what's it like coming to this place? So it's a, it's a wonderful way to think about what um, might be possible. And we sure hope we can build this building. So the important question, why are we doing this? So this is my favorite book, um, thinking about this project. It has inspired our approach. It's called 13 Ways to Kill Your Community by Doug Griffiths. 
And his thesis is that the four pillars of a successful community are healthcare, education, economic, and community infrastructure. Well, I'd like to think that the project that we are proposing addresses every single one of these pillars. So his book is really predicated, I mean, it's reverse psychology. These are the things you don't want to do. But if you do aim to kill your community, he has a chapter devoted to each of these topics. So um, thinking about an opportunity to um, present for the chamber, you know, a lot of these are uh, business and economic uh, development related kind of um, topics and uh, ways to think about what can we do to enhance our community or kill it. So I would encourage you all, if you haven't read this book, there's a, co there's a hardcover copy in the Benzie Shores uh, District Library, and you can order um, a copy on Amazon as well. It's a wonderful, easy read, easy breezy read, and um, really gets you thinking about um, ways to, um, instead of killing your community, really make it thrive. So what are some of the keys that uh, could make this project come to life? Well, community and connection is really um, so important to what we're thinking about. And you, um, the two previous um, presenters have talked about the importance of um, you know, social connections and all. And um, it's so important for our physical and mental health. And I'm gonna click on this link to a short TED Talk you probably will only be able to hear it and not see it, um, but it's a talking head and you're not gonna miss much if you don't the see her. Answer is not what we expect. She's asking she what reduces your chances of dying. At Young University. And she addressed this very question in a series of studies of tens of thousands of middle-aged people. And she looked at every aspect of their lifestyle, their diet, their exercise, their marital status, how often they went to the doctor, whether they smoked or drank, etc. She recorded all of this, and then she and her colleagues sat tight and waited for seven years to see who would still be breathing. And of the people left standing, what reduced their chances of dying the most? That was her question. So let's now look at her data in summary, going from the least powerful predictor to the strongest. Whether you're lean or overweight, you can stop feeling guilty about this because it's only in third place. How much exercise you get is next, still only a moderate predictor. Did anybody here know that having a flu vaccine protects you more than doing exercise? And getting towards the top predictors are two features of your social life. First, your close relationships. These are the people that you can call on for a loan if you need money suddenly, who will call the doctor if you're not feeling well, or who will take you to the hospital, or who will sit with you if you're having an ex existential crisis, if you're in despair. That, those people, that little clutch of people are a strong predictor if you have them of how long you'll live. And then something that surprised me, something that's called social integration. This means how much you interact with people as you move through your day. How many people do you talk to? And these mean both your weak and your strong bonds. So not just the people you're really close to who mean a lot to you, but like, do you talk to the guy who every day makes you your coffee? Um, do you talk to the postman? Do you talk to the woman who walks by your house every day with her dog? Do you play bridge or poker or have a book club? Those interactions are one of the strongest predictors of how long you live. So I'm sorry if you couldn't see her, but um, you know, bottom line is let's make sure we're providing spaces and places and programs where people can gather, whether it's meeting rooms or just walking along a track together um, so they can um, interact with other people. That's really a core key for us. Of course, fitness, rec uh, re rehab, and recreation, all drivers for good health. And um, recreation, of course, is an uh, important component uh, for Northwest Michigan's tourism, which is our economic engine. And I've recently been hearing from the um, MEDC, so the Michigan Economic Development Corporation, a new line of thinking, which is recreation is infrastructure. 
So it's as important as, you know, having, you know, clean water to drink and, you know, safe roads to drive on and, you know, broadband and, and, you know, it just should be part of um, what we expect to offer when we live in a thriving and vibrant place. And from a business development point of view, what is it that people leave Benzie County to purchase or experience that maybe we could provide instead? So I'm a perfect example. I'm a swimmer. And when it's too cold to swim in Crystal Lake, I drive up to Traverse City. We're members of the Y and I'm able to go to the pool there. And, you know, nine times out of 10, if I'm up there, I'll probably stop and buy some groceries. I might put gas in my car. I might stop at the drugstore. You know, I'm making those choices to um, uh, go shopping and um, frequent businesses um, that are convenient to the place where I'm going to exercise because gosh darn it, I just put 90 miles uh, round trip on my car and I really want to maximize that time. So how are we going to do this? Well, we are hoping for community and partner focus. And want to find out, you know, what are we missing here in Benzie County that could enhance, you know, your business or organization? And one of those factors is um, we think our, a facility that we're proposing to build can help improve recruitment and retention opportunities um, for prospective residents um, with reasons to live here year round and also to try to attract those boomerang kids. So you're a lot of young people. Um, grow up and just, you know, the lure of Chicago or, or downstate or, or living in a big urban environment is really appealing to a young person, but ultimately many of them boomerang and want to come back home and we need to give them reasons why uh, they would find this an attractive place to live. So thinking about business planning um, leads us to a site and what are some of the opportunities for synergy. So I will tell you our home run site um, that we are considering is uh, the Crystal Lake Elementary School, um, which will be is planned to be vacant in September of 2023 when the new Homestead Hills Elementary School opens at the main campus on Homestead Road for the Benzie Central School System. We've been in conversation with the school board since January earnestly. And uh, we hope to be able to continue that conversation and um, end up at um, on a pathway where we are able to um, acquire that site and um, get going on what this uh, facility could um, really look like once we know what our site is. So that's such a wonderful location. It's the busiest intersection all of Benziconi where we have the only stoplight. You've got connection, you've got walkability to the village of Beulah, you've got walkability to the village of Benzonia, you've got the Betsy Valley Trail running behind it, you've got Mills Community House basically next door, which has a library and some additional community spaces. And then on the other side of that, you've got Academy Park with a ball field and four tennis courts. So we see lots and lots of opportunities for synergy there. And thinking about that whole, this kind of a neighborhood and making that a gateway for Benzie County um, with maybe the impetus being the um, construction of our facility and repurposing the community asset that Crystal Lake Elementary School has been for so long. So some of the sample uh, partnership types we're thinking about, um, obviously site uh, partnering uh, with the school system. Um, help with um, some of the funding that we're going to need, operational support, program providers, um, advocacy and networking, and, you know, memberships. Uh, we're, you know, absolutely taking a look at the idea of, you know, say partnering with the local hospitality industry and, you know, maybe they could provide um, punch cards to their overnight guests at a little bit of a discount and those people could come in um, for a limited um, number of visits. So not just only memberships, but who live here year round, but opportunities for people who are shorter than year rounders to be able to come in and use this place as well. We've been 
talking for years with a number of potential uh, community partners. Some of these conversations are farther along than others, um, but you just see a sampling of some of the organizations we've been talking to. So health and wellness and fitness, of course, is an obvious connection. Recreation and tourism, transportation. I mean, the people of Benzie Bus are the greatest problem solvers I've ever met, honestly. The school districts. Uh, philanthropy and service organizations. We've really been blessed that um, some of our funding partners to date are on this slide. So Rotary Charities, the Community Foundation, the Seabury Foundation, Benzie Sunrise Rotary Club, um, the Ann and Les or Les and Ann Biederman Foundation is another one who supported us to date. And then thinking about public um, partners. So um, our, uh, we've been working with uh, the Benzie County Parks and Recreation Commission for a number of years. And we see just recently have started talking with uh, the US Department of Agriculture's Rural Development Office, the MEDC, the DNR supports all kinds of recreational programs. And I have to tell you the Coast Guard is one of the um, organizations that's most excited about this project because they have to do most of their training in um, the uh, fall. Um, once the busy summer season is over in Lake Michigan and the commandant um, will tell you um, the uh, attention span of, of his staff when they are in cold water is about at a kindergarten level. So he would really be excited about training his folks in a warmer uh, pool environment. So some of the questions we get most often, is this gonna be duplicative? No, we're gonna try to make sure uh, we integrate and collaborate with uh, our uh, partners um, so we aren't duplicating uh, programs and services as much as possible when it makes sense. Is it feasible? Yes, we have a project management consultant team that has worked through a demand analysis using uh, real-time data and demographic information for Benzie County. And um, there, we do think if we build an integrated facility, there will be enough demand that this will be viable. Is it sustainable? Yes, we're planning uh, between the initial investment uh, with a capital campaign that will uh, need to happen, um, as well as grant opportunities and a plan to have an endowment uh, safety net for operations and maintenance. Um, so um, one of the um, best examples of how not to do this is, um, and one that comes up all the time is, well, what about the Kalkaska Coliseum? And that, um, interesting facility which combines indoor aquatics and uh, indoor ice arenas uh, was built with um, public support. There were two millage opportunities that were presented to the citizens of Kalkaska over 20 years ago. One millage was to build the facility. The second millage was to maintain it. They passed the millage to build it. They did not pass the millage to ma maintain it, but they built it anyway. And so you had a situation where you had deferred and underfunded maintenance for decades. And finally, you know, the upshot was there was so much um, uh, degradation in the pool that they had to close it. And, um, you know, we are not going to have that happen here. We will make sure that we have um, the resources we need to be able to maintain uh, the facility. So next steps. Partner roles, we're, we're talking to lots of folks and we'd love to have conversations with um, uh, organizations that maybe haven't even thought about, boy, maybe this could be, there could be some wonderful connections here and we'd love to talk with you. So we'd love to invite you to engage with our team. So our project management consultant is a fellow named Kurt Meyer of Health Integration Partners. He's based down in Grand Rapids. He uh, had a long career in health and wellness. His last um, corporate job was at with um, Mary Freebed Hospital down in Grand Rapids. And he also chaired the board of um, one of the YMCAs down in Grand Rapids. Um, Bill Kennis, I'm happy to uh, say, has um, been a wonderful volunteer for us for some time now. And he has stepped up in recent months and is helping us as our project coordinator. And he is just determined to get this to the finish line and uh, couldn't be more grateful for all the good work he's doing on our behalf. We have some advisory groups and volunteers that help us, uh, the volunteers help us with programming, the advisory groups we convene from time to time when we're working on a particular um, 
uh, uh, initiative or challenge. Um, so we pull them together and then they disband. And then when we have the next topic we need help with, we pull them together and disband and go like that. And then of course our own board of directors. And then facilitating access to capital. So our short-term needs will be for the site acquisition, uh, the design and costing phase of this project will be next in terms of hiring an architect and going beyond just conceptual renderings. And then we'll have uh, no doubt um, uh, uh, um, a robust and probably complicated capital stack in terms of private and public funding to construct and provide for that long-term um, sustainability endowment um, for the project. So um, I, I just think, you know, we've been talking about, you know, the need for indoor aquatic facility at a minimum for decades here and um, thinking about, you know, the impacts of the pandemic, that social recession that we talked about and the need for people to have a gathering place and, and uh, find ways to connect with people and get up and move. Uh, you feel better. You have endorphins get released when you are active rather than sitting and um, just, you know, playing video games or whatever it is. So I'd love to hear from folks. And if you have questions or would like more information, I've provided my contact information and we do, we've just created a website. It's still in its infancy. We hope to develop it um, a lot further as we go along and um, uh, be able to um, include more information as our, our project um, moves forward. And hopefully there will be lots of good news in the not too distant future. So love to open it up if anyone has a question or two or three or four i'm happy to uh try to respond i i got a couple things diane um just as a reminder yeah, for our attendees if you want to speak just uh raise your hand and i will unmute you um on the renderings for the crystal lake elementary is that um tearing down the facility or are you ex using some of the existing walls that are there it's really too early to say um <laughs> The school system has been generously um, shared with us the engineering report that they um, got when they were considering renovating that school rather than building a new one. So we're, we're aware of um, the considerable um, costs that would be involved to just bring that building up to snuff as an elementary school. Mm -hmm. You know, it, we need to have wider open spaces, which mean lots of um, big support beams because the school is like a lot of little classrooms, right? right. And we need wider open spaces. Mm -hmm. So um, until we would be in a position to get um, a structural engineer mm -hmm. in to really take a look, it's too early to say um, whether um, that uh, makes some sense. A whole nother consideration is there's a fair amount of um, light elimination resources right. available from the state. Mm -hmm. And the land bank has been taking a look at that um, particular property and considering whether it would make sense to apply for some funding to, to um, uh, ameliorate um, some of the, um, the nasties. <laughs> that's the, not the technical term, but, you know, deal with um, some of the known um, contaminants and some of the other issues that are there. So um, we know just this rendering. So behind me is, is you know, like the architect's plan of the, the picture that we looked at with the roof off where you saw the pools and all. Um, we know that if it ends up being that kind of a square footage, it fits on the, it and that site um, with some, um, of course, uh, renovation. Whether uh, the whole building comes down or not, um, we don't know yet. Yep. Um, on the blight money, the state of Michigan, out of the general fund, gave every single county $270,000 to eliminate blight. Um, if it was a land bank, the fiduciary was the land bank. And we have one, Shelly's Great, over there in Crystal Lake Elementary was one of the properties yeah. that was earmarked for some of those funds. Right. Um, just as a fun fact, again, a con a concept, um, I did, because I sit in many things, they were talking about the old high school building 
Mm -hmm. um, across the street and the new owner, I don't know if that sale has went through, please forgive me if I misspeak, um, was looking at some of the actual architecture that's on there. And I know in Frankfurt, they found some art deco um, door framing or something that they ended up taking out. But I guess there's a significant amount in that building and the new person that wants to acquire it wants to retain some of that. And they were looking at like some senior housing. So, I mean, I'm envisioning that, you know, in, in the 10 or 15 year plan that that ends up being like a campus encompassing that building where the old high school is and the playground that's behind that, that's part of Crystal Lake Elementary. Um, not sure how that little house behind the, because they're right across the street from me. There's like one little home behind, between Crystal Lake Elementary and the tax building. Like they would probably end up selling out, I would think. Just well, kind of no, I, I don't know. So just um, thank you for bringing that up. So yeah, so that's one of the things when we're, we're contemplating the sort of synergy in the neighborhood, you know, and placemaking, that's a big, you know, if we can think about these various, you know, who owns Mills Community House? Who owns Academy Park? Who's going to own the old Benzie High School? Who's you know? And, and think about the opportunities for some neighborhood revitalization. You know that opens up the doors to some potential additional funding sources. So I will give you a quick little update on the uh, Benzie High School, the old Benzie High School. So um, last Thursday, um, the 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 old Benzie High School and the Crystal Lake Elementary School are in the village of Benzonia, and. Uh, uh, an organization, a different organization. Um, so there were two organizations interested in uh, purchasing the old Benzie High School. One was uh, a folks, some folks downstate who wanted to create a project called Benzie Lofts, which would be a 30 unit senior uh, living facility. That's the one I heard. The other one is Furnace Street Distillery, which bought the old Trick Dog in Alberta and their proposal would be to um, build a manufacturing facility, a tasting room, some warehousing ability, and potentially some um, uh, residential space for some of their employees. Mm -hmm. So it's the distillery folks oh. that actually have entered into a purchase and sale agreement with the owner of that property, which is not the school anymore. So the school sold it to the fellow who owns that accounting firm that's across the street from you. That's the owner. So the distillery folks need a variance in the zoning, which is currently zoned C1, um, and they need one element from C2, which is the warehousing ability to be able to uh, make their dream come true. And so the, the process there is they had to have a public hearing, which is what I went to last Thursday, um, with the planning commission for the village of Benzonia to put in a request for this, you know, here's what we want to do and, and here's why we need the variance. Planning Commission has the ability to make a recommendation to the Village Council, which is going to meet on May 1st, and the Village Council's actually the body that can do thumbs up or thumbs down. So interestingly, there are five residences in that neighborhood. You see one easily, but there's actually five homeowners in there. Yeah, behind four, there. Four, yeah, four out of the five were at this meeting. Every single one of them was thumbs up. I said, you know, the reason we live in this neighborhood, it's zoned mixed use, you know, commercial and residential, and we're tired of looking at blight, and it's an attractive nuisance. Kids come in and get into, you know, break windows, and, you know, let's see something, like, let's see this vibrant and lively, and somebody come in and do something with this. So um, every single one, there were zero opponents. Everyone was a proponent, so the commission and it fits in with their long-term master plan. So it's, it's thumbs up and off to village council. So we'll see what happens from there. And, and in order to get for, for the group, um, federal and state money for like, especially housing developments, we need water and sewer. And that's also on the table yes. uh, for Benzonia Township and the village of Benzonia. Yes. Um, Beulah still has some work to do with their ponds to be able to connect to the sewer authority as they're calling themselves now. Mm -hmm. So yeah, lots of great things happening right behind me um, and along that US 31 corridor and, uh, you know, love to see the Benzie Aquatic Center to be a part of that. Me and too. I will Thank open you. the floor one last time because we got about six minutes and I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Or if there's anything else that we need to talk about from any of our three panelists. 
hope everybody's uh, we will do another one of these. I haven't got all my players uh, in place. Probably the last week of July or sometime in August, um, our topic is going to be what I'm calling natural assets. So it's going to be uh, the Betsy Valley Trail. Uh, I'd like to get in uh, Casey over at the Lighthouse to talk about uh, the the federal funds that they just got for um, repairing the seawall just on our preservation there. And in case you didn't know, if you're not in Stacey Daniels' world, it's the 150th anniversary of the lowering of Crystal Lake, um, which involves the dam and that thing is like 50 years old. So uh, in terms of ARPA dollars and infrastructure, uh, Ed Hoopterp is looking for some funds to um, update that just so we can get another 50 years out of it. So um, the CLCBA will be doing a celebration at their Crystal Lake Marathon. I believe that's in August. Um, forgive me if I misspoke. And um, that that whole that's when that celebration of the hundred. Otherwise, Beulah would still be an underwater, and we'd all need waiters to go there. Um, so yeah, lots of exciting things going on, but we'll do another making Benzy butter, uh, like at that timeline, end of July, early August ish. And uh, that is all I have on the chamber side. And I want to thank everyone for coming today and thank you for participating. I do have this recorded. Um, so if you need a copy of that for whatever reason uh, for your organizations or to share with uh, your coworkers, let me know and I'll forward that along. And thank you to our attendees and we will dip out. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.